Good morning, everyone. Glad that you're here. Uh, today, I'll cover James chapter 2, and let's just get right into it. As you can see here, the uh, heading, Favoritism Forbidden. So apparently back in James Day, there were many within the congregation who had fallen into a trap of uh, favoring the uh, rich and despising the poor or not treating the poor equally. Let's uh, talk about that because uh, favoritism is a sin. Now, beginning here at uh, chapter 2, James writes, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. And he gives an example. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, when one shows favoritism, what are you doing? You're not only sinning, but you're placing yourselves as judges over others. You're looking at the outer or the outward appearance of a person. In this example, a person wearing a gold ring and fine clothes uh, and another person who comes in and uh, this person is poor and filthy and wearing old clothes. Continuing here at uh, verse 5, James goes on to say, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? You see, in our lowly thinking here uh, on earth as uh, humans, there's a narrative that uh, if you have lots of money, wealth, you wear fine clothes, you have college degrees, you know, you have it all, so to speak, that uh, God has blessed you and uh, that you occupy some favorite uh, or favorite position before God. See, those are human thoughts. Those are not godly thoughts, because as James uh, gives us a, a lesson here, he says, here in verse five, has not God chose those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to do what? Inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. I've lived and worked in parts of the world uh, many people would not even believe. And one day I'll take the time to discuss uh, the many places in the world where I lived and worked. And what I've observed among the many who are poor and who have nothing, they really have to rely upon God each and every day. And what uh, I've observed is that while they might not have much or have anything, they're not lacking. There's fruit on trees, there's vegetables that grow out of the ground, where there's bodies of water, whether they are rivers or lakes, oceans, there's an abundance of uh, aquatic life that they uh, eat. When I was down in Ecuador many years ago, I met uh, a family, it was a family of four, husband, wife, and two small children, and they invited me to their home for lunch. I accepted and I went over there. And they lived way out, way out in the country, but actually near the mountains. And uh, their home was uh, a stucco slash mud shack, no electricity, lots of uh, animals running around, dogs, cats. The, uh, the man, what he did uh, for a living is that he would take um, any produce from uh, the chickens that they had and any of the uh, fruits that grew on his property, and he would take them five miles one way into town each and every day. That's on a good day, and he would sell uh, his uh, produce. He didn't make much money. But what I found interesting is that even though those persons didn't have much in a material way, they were rich in faith and in their love for God, and that humbled me. Back then, my thinking was very immature. And as we're sitting down and enjoying a modest meal, I asked him, what did he want? Uh, if there was anything that I can do for him? And he said, uh, no, I'm, upset. I'm satisfied. He says uh, that he's been working very hard to save money. Uh, and one day he wants to buy a goat. And I'm thinking, that's it? That's all you want is a goat? He says, because a goat will provide him many amenities. A goat will uh, 
consume the garbage and keep the vegetation down around his property. A goat will provide milk for his family, and that milk can be uh, made into cheese that would feed his family. And a goat, he can use as a goat to mate with uh, other uh, owners of goats and they can and he can uh, one day have a, a nice um, herd of goats and my thinking I'm like wow and I really felt ashamed he didn't want anything from me uh, not even my sympathy and see that was my immaturity back then uh, but he thanked me he says no thank you you are my friend uh, God will provide for me and my family he has so far and here it is I'm a person who was born and raised in the United States in someone else's country assuming that he wanted what I have a car or a house and money in the bank he didn't want any of those things in his view why there's just extra money you have to to earn to uh, to keep those things maintained he didn't want all the extra burden and to look at him and his family they were very happy their children they weren't dressed as Many of the children that I know, uh, having uh, been born and raised in the United States, uh, his children, they had clothes on their backs, but nothing, and we would call them rags, but they were clothes. The kids were, they were uh, happy, laughing, playful, friendly. They were very respectful. They couldn't speak English, you know, the children. Uh, even his wife, uh, she couldn't speak English. She spoke some broken English, but enough where we could communicate. And that was a very humbling experience. But you know, if that person would have come to the United States and go into any of the many uh, churches that uh, we have here, he would be looked upon as being a person who was homeless. So that's something to think about. So again, has not God chose those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? At verse 6, James goes on to say, But you have dishonored the poor. And that's exactly what I did. I dishonored that man. Rather than me learning from him. And like, you know, you take two knives and you sharpen them together. Iron sharpens iron. And I learned from that man. I learned humility. And putting faith in God. Not paying lip service to it. But actually trusting God and having faith in him that he will provide for me. And James goes on to ask, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom you belong? At verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, check this out, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. If you show favoritism, you are a sinner and you are cast into the lot of those who are lawbreakers. So for the many uh, who profess faith in Christ and who love to point fingers at others, uh, keep in mind here that if you show favoritism, uh, you are a sinner. Uh, you are a lawbreaker. You are no different from a person, say, who steals or who murders. You are a lawbreaker. So with that tidbit of knowledge, that should keep all of us humble and not snub our noses at uh, others who are not like us and who do not believe as we do. Many get out there and they just want to debate everything about God and Christ with others. In my view, that is a waste of precious time that could best be used elsewhere to assist others to come to the feet of Christ as his disciple. What the debating and fighting and quarreling does is that it repels persons from coming into or coming before Christ as their uh, teacher. Those persons who think that they're uh, doing a service to God in Christ are actually, and many unwittingly, are becoming uh, their worst enemies. At verse 11, for he who said, you must not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. This is interesting because James likens favoritism to a person who, say, uh, commits adultery or who 
uh, commits murder. In God's eyes, there is no difference. A sin is a sin. There is no sin that's greater or lesser. Sin is sin. Period. At verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. How many of us are merciful? How many of us are judgmental? What I have observed in my lifetime and what I'm observing today is that there are many who profess faith in Christ. They're very judgmental. You see them on the pulpit. You can go to YouTube right now and you'll find many of them. They are quick to judge others, slow to show any mercy towards anyone who doesn't uh, accept what they say or believe as they do. That is not the way of the master Christ Jesus. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And aren't we glad that God has shown us mercy? God didn't have to send his son into the world to undo the effects of what Adam did. He was merciful. Christ himself was merciful. Remember on that day that he died, before he died, uh, his last breaths uh, were in prayer to his father, and he asked the father to forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus showed mercy. So why is it that so many of us today who claim that we are uh, his followers and that we believe in him cannot do the same. We cannot show mercy towards others. You see, oftentimes we assume that people just know. 99.9% .9 of the population of the world today doesn't know. Jesus knew that. Jesus recognized that. Because a person goes to church or they read the Bible, they quote scripture, doesn't mean that they know. What they know is that they know how to read. They have not put the pieces of the puzzle together. They're relying upon their own knowledge and understanding to become spiritual persons rather than relying upon God's wisdom, God's understanding, God's wisdom, God's intelligence to assist us in understanding the deeper things of God. But yet, so many refuse to show mercy. Instead, they place themselves as judges over others and they cast them into a place of eternal torment. That is so, so cruel. And as I said in a previous video, that is something Jesus never did. And it makes one wonder why those many persons who profess faith in Christ, why do they do that? Why? From what source is that mentality? Next, James goes on to talk about faith and deeds. And this apparently was a problem uh, back then in James' day because he talks about it. At verse 14, James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds, that's works, can such faith save them? I love James' reasoning powers. At verse 15, he says, Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. This is a very valuable lesson. And as James says, you're supposed to see a person, say, who's on the street and uh, it's cold outside. They don't have a coat or anything. And you say that a person keep warm and well fed, but you don't take any action to ensure that that person has a hot meal in their belly or a warm coat. You see, James is saying here in the same way, faith by itself is nothing. Faith must be accompanied by deeds. Faith without works is dead. And I mentioned in the previous video that in future days, followers of Christ will be put to a severe test during the future Great Tribulation. So you can have faith, but if you don't have works that's accompanied by your faith, you're not going to make it. And the works that one might have to um, exhibit during that uh, uh, dreadful future time might be um, 
speaking and not succumbing to the uh, tremendous pressures that one may will be uh, submitted to or helping a weaker one who's on that path as well, who's in that with you and helping that person along. See, they may stumble uh, when they're in that great tribulation, but you know, you're enduring it for a time, but you are the stronger of the two. So you help the weaker ones to stand on their feet and you help to push them along so they can get to the end as well. So our faith alone isn't going to cut it. This is what James is uh, explaining. Now, verse 18, he says, but someone will say, but you have faith. I have deeds. Then James says, well, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You see, the faith must be there first. How does one build faith? By taking in an accurate knowledge of God and Christ, by taking in an accurate knowledge of the one that the Most High God sent. I'm not referring to taking in a knowledge of a book. That's a mistake. Read the book, sure, but that's not where your focus should be. Our focus should be on the one that the Most High God sent us and commanded us at Luke chapter 9, verse 35, to listen to. The words of Christ are life-saving. All wisdom and knowledge is tied up in Christ Jesus. We listen to him. That's how you build up your faith. And once the faith is there, then you demonstrate that you have a real faith by the things that you do. At verse 19, I thought this was very interesting because there are those who are Trinitarians who will not touch this scripture. This is one of many scriptures that uh, Trinitarians refuse to uh, consider. But at verse 19, James says, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Isn't that something? Even demons believe that there's one God. And at that belief, they shudder. Yet Trinitarians don't believe that there's one God. They may say that there's one God, but the Trinity doctrine is confusing. To them, they say it's not confusing. Yes, it is. It even goes against what uh, the ancients believed about God, that there was one God. You see, the Trinity teaching teaches that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, or God the Holy Ghost. There are three, but one. There are not three gods. There's only one God. Then James, uh, well, I suppose his choice of words here is interesting, too, because he says, You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. See, faith without works is dead. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And a scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteous. And he was called God's friend. This is what we want to be. We want to be God's friends, not God's enemy. We don't want enmity between ourselves and God. We want his approval, not the approval of men. At verse 24, James goes on to say, You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So what we do, that is our works and our deeds, work hand in hand with the faith that we claim that we have. At verse 25, in the same way was not even Rahab, the prostitute, a prostitute considered righteous. You see, for the many who uh, profess faith in Christ, you see, you point fingers at persons, but here we have a prostitute. You see this here? A prostitute was considered righteous. Why? For what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and set them off in a different direction. Be careful, folks. Be careful if you are uh, a professed believer in Christ and you point fingers at others, prostitutes, drug dealers, persons who you consider sinners. You see that prostitute, what is that? That's sin, is it not? But even those persons can be considered righteous for the things that they do. And I've met many persons who were not good persons in the the eyes of the world of many people who have done good things uh, uh, to help me so you just never know 
But here we have a prostitute who was considered righteous for what she did, you see. She gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. So James concludes here, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So one can't just say, well, I believe, I have faith. You must demonstrate that you have faith by the things that you do, not just for yourself, but how you treat and view others, even persons who are not like you and who do not believe as you do. We should never, never, never judge other persons. Leave that in God's hands. I saw a few videos of an individual who was, uh, uh, he was a, he is an air quote Christian minister, preacher, pastor, issuing rebukes to this person over here who claims that he himself is a Christian too, and issuing rebukes to uh, that person over there who claims that he he's a Christian. And I'm thinking, surely we cannot be that uh, hateful and judgmental of others and so blind that we cannot see that when we point a finger at someone else, at others, there are three more uh, pointing back at us. We should never uh, do that. When we do that, what we're saying is that we ourselves are righteous. We're all sinners. So we can learn a great deal from Jesus' half-brother, James. So in the uh, next uh, few days, I'll put up uh, a video and we'll go through chapter 3. This is R. Jerome Harris. Thank you for listening.